Hello and welcome to a presentation on Humean Supervenience to Bugs. It's a uh, paper by David Lewis published in 1994 on what he calls the big bad bug. And uh, I'm Paul Jones, senior studying philosophy at Rutgers. So let's get started. Um, this was published 14 years after the Subjectivist Guide to Objective Chance, where Lewis develops his theory of what chance is. He uh, is extending the work that he did in another paper called New Work for Theory of Universals, uh, but he, want, he wants it to go into indeterministic worlds, that is, worlds that it's, uh, it's not determined in advance what the, uh, the outcome of the world's going to be, that is, that there's some probability that it'll be some world, some probability that it'll be another. Um, his goal is that he wants a, a reduction of laws and chances together in a human picture of the world that uh, is tenable, that's attractive. Um, he wants the principal principle and the best systems account of laws, and there's a problem with holding these views naively, so he's going to want to solve that. So, how does, he, uh, how does he do this? Well, first he reintroduces human supervenience in the best system analysis of laws. Uh, and then he develops two candidates for uh, how, we, how we might explain chance, subsequently rejects them. Um, he introduces probabilistic laws into his best systems analysis of laws, and what makes this possible is this, his notion of fit. Um, he brings up a problem, preempts an objection to the view, uh, his human analysis of laws, with what he calls undermining, and uh, he solves it. So, let's get started on that, on that first one. Um, what is human supervenience? So, you have to start off with uh, saying that any truth whatever is made true, the truth maker for that truth, is the pattern of instantiation of fundamental relations. Um, all contingent truth is going to supervene just on that pattern of co-instantiation. Humean superve supervenience is a uh, speculation that's added to this uh, to this thesis, um, saying that the fundamental relations are exactly the spatio-temporal ones. That is, uh, they are the, if you want to describe something perfectly, uh, see what, what that thing is, uh, if you look at where it is in space and how it's related to other things in space, and if you look where it is in time and how it's related to other things in time, that is what's fundamental about it. Um, and in worlds like ours, the fundamental properties are local qualities, they're uh, immediately present or something. And uh, all else supervenes on the spatio-temporal arrangement of qualities throughout the past, present, and future. Um, and this is where he has this uh, really interesting line, because there's, there's been some attacks on, uh, on human supervenience, on uh, spatio-temporal qualities being uh, the fundamental property, and he has this, this passage where he says, The point of defending human supervenience is not to support reactionary physics, but rather to resist philosophical arguments that there are no more things in heaven and earth than physics has dreamt of. Therefore, if I defend the philosophical tenability of human supervenience, excuse me, that defense can doubtless be adapted to whatever better supervenience thesis may emerge from a better uh, physics. So that's sort of interesting, um, you know, quantum physics and uh, its uh, wave functions and probability uh, like innately probabilistic seems to um, so, some physicists have suggested that maybe space, spatio-temporal uh, properties aren't fundamental. So interesting. He uh, doesn't want to be that reactionary. Um, there's also this discussion of uh, the spinning disk, and the spinning disk is supposed to show that uh, human supervenience doesn't capture everything about about the world and the way that you formulate it um armstrong and kripke are, are call this different call these two different things and um both evidently uh formulated them independently so take two worlds not works two worlds of homogeneous matter you know maybe a, a sphere um and the only difference between those two worlds is that one of the, the spheres is spinning the reason it's a uh it's a counterexample to human supervenience is that there's 
there's something that's not spatio-temporal. There, there's nothing you can point to in space and time that's going to distinguish those two worlds. So the, the fundamental properties must be elsewhere. Um, Lewis bites the bullet on this one. He says that uh, human supervenience is contingent, so it's going to be true in worlds like ours, um, and that this world is not sufficiently like ours. You know, uh, so it's interesting that human supervenience is contingent. It's not going to be necessarily true. It's going to be true of all worlds. But whatever the case, let's move on. Um, so here are those two. Uh, here are those two candidates for what what chance might be. But first, let's uh, take a look at what he means by these terms. Chance is taken to be the objective single case probability. It's a sort of metaphysical property that's in the world. Credence, on the other hand, is degree of belief, sort of chance being the metaphysical concept, the thing that's there. And then credence is, is the epistemological concept. It's um, how to, to believe on, the, on, the, on those, uh, how to believe on the basis of chance. Um, chance is connected to credence. For instance, if a rational believer knew that chance, that the, the chance of an event was 50%, then there's little that could um, move the person to, to rationally believe that one event over another is uh, going to be more likely, that they're both, uh, they're, both, they're both equally as likely, both 50% chance. That's um, how chance can be connected to credence. Um, consider now what the consequences of uh, human supervenience might be on a, on a credence function, like what it would take in the spatio-temporal uh, relations of things to, to make chance and to make credence. Um, that is, it's, it's going to be that whatever makes it true that the chance is 50% must also be whatever makes it rational to believe uh, to the degree 50% that an event will occur if known. Um, so, now that we know a little bit about what he means by chance and credence, let's uh, take a look at some candidates for chance makers, what he calls symmetry and frequencies. So, uh, this is quite funny, I think it's worth quoting in full. Um, it's meant to express the principle of indifference, which I, uh, I looked up to see what it was, and it seems a little crazy dividing up logical space to get s sample spaces for probabilities, but whatever the case, here it is. Uh, suppose a drunkard is wandering through a maze of T-junctions, and at each junction we can find nothing that looks like a relevant difference between the case that he turns left in the case that he turns right, we could well understand if rational credence had to treat the cases alike for the lack of relevant difference. If symmetry is something that would, if known, constrain credence, then it would be suitable to serve as a, as a chance maker. And uh, Lewis notes that an unrestricted principle of indifference is inconsistent because you can always hook up your properties and get it to say anything you like. Um, but limit the principle only to natural properties. Uh, he has two reservations about using symmetries like this. The first is that uh, there's reason to think that uh, symmetries do not underlie the chance phenomena that we think there are. Um, it would be nice to think this is Lewis. This is it would be nice to think that uh, each tritium atom contains a tiny drunk drunkard in a maze of symmetrical T junctions. His other objection is that uh, symmetries are only defeasible constrainers of rational credence. Therefore, they can only be defeasible chance makers. Uh, and he says of this, the symmetry of the T junctions would no longer require 50 50 division of credence if we also knew that despite the symmetry, the junction, the drunkard turns right nine times out of ten. So he uh, thinks they're bad candidates for some of those reasons. And uh, he moves on to frequencies. And uh, frequencies are, I think, a little bit easier to pin down. I had trouble following along with, with symmetries. Frequencies are a pattern in the spatio-temporal arrangement of qualities. You can pretty easily intuit how these patterns could constrain rational credence. Fre frequencies, however, will not be a useful answer if we can't distinguish natural from gerrymandered uh, kinds. Um, so he, sa he says of this that large chance systems seem to be put together out of many copies of very small chance systems, and 
very small chance system often do come in, in enormous classes of exact copies. If this is the important part, you you've you see one tritium atom, you've seen them all. So, what are some problems for uh, holding that frequencies in the spatio-temporal arrangement of things, or what what are chance makers? Well, he uh, illustrates it with what he calls unobtainium. Very funny examples of unobtainium and different isotopes of unobtainium. Um, so, consider unobtainium 346. It's hard to make this stuff uh, in all of space and time. Posit that there have only been two. Um, one had a lifetime of 4.8 microseconds, and the other had a life of 6.1. What's the probability of decay? Well, it seems ill defined because think that um, it could change going forward, like maybe maybe it's in between the two, like but it just seems unlikely. You know, you're going to want to do a lot of these tests and try to work out what the what the probability of decay is. Now consider uh, unobtainium 349. Uh, this isotope is even harder to make, and there's only been, there hasn't been a single instance of it through space and time. What's the probability of decay? Well, there's uh, going to be a zero in your denominator somewhere. This is totally undefined, yet there's probably an answer in principle, or it's just not given by frequency, though. Um, finally, uh, this is what I think is the most interesting one. If space-time is, is finite with a small chance system, then all the frequencies are going to be rational numbers. Yet many real numbers are irrational, and we have no reason to doubt that chances in a finite world can take irrational values. So, uh, the answer to this problem of unobtainium is, Lewis thinks, remembering that single-case chances follow from general probabilistic laws of nature. So, let's take a look at some laws. We uh, now go to the next goal of ours, which is to reintroduce the best systems analysis of laws. Um, put most simply, um, a regularity is a law, if and only if, it is a theorem of the best system. Uh, take all the deductive systems whose theorems are true. Some of them are going to be simpler, some of them are going to be better systematized, some will be stronger, more informative than others, and these virtues compete. Um, an uninformative system can be very simple, and an unsystemized compendium of miscellaneous information can be um, very interesting. <laughs> uh, the best system uh, is the one that strikes a good balance, uh, as good a balance as truth will allow between simplicity and strength. You sort of uh, take all uh, all your laws. Um, you you don't want to list every event in the universe. It's going to happen, but you also don't want to miss miss things. You you want a nice balance, and uh, how good this this is is going to depend on this. Uh, he uses this quite a bit. He says this: how kind nature is, how forgiving, or something, or how uh, we'll uh, see this more often, and we'll get a better sense of what he means by this. Um, but there's this problem for this this analysis. Uh, that is, uh, where do these standards come from? Like, what is simplicity and strength? Like, where does it, like, uh, how do we get a, an objective notion of what, what that is? Uh, it seems to be from us, but Lewis doesn't want that to write. He, he, he doesn't want subjectivism. He, he wants these things to be, uh, dem demonstrable to everyone. Uh, if we don't like the laws of nature, we can change the laws. And make them have always been different, which is weird, just by changing the way we think. Um, Lewis used to think that the solution to this was rigid <laughs> to rigidify <laughs> uh, the laws to solve the problem, but now he thinks that this is cosmetic only. So, we want to solve the problem of standards some other way, some other way and we return to this notion of uh, nature being kind. Uh, Lewis says that if nature is kind to us, the problem needn't arise. And he, he submits that simplicity and strength are going to be partly a matter of psychology. Um, but also, it's not because of how we think that, a, for example, a linear function is simpler than a quartic function or a step function. Um, if nature has been kind, then the best system is going to be robustly best, Lewis thinks. The trouble is with unkind nature, 
No, the trouble is with unkind nature, not not Lewis's analysis. And Lewis says, uh, we should cross the bridge when we get there. Hmm. Uh, so, having, having solved that, we now come to the best system of analysis and adding in the concept of chance that we, uh, we explored earlier. Um, and the way that he does this is with his notion of fit. He wants to modify the best system analysis to make it deliver chances and laws in one package deal. The way that Lewis does this is with his notion of fit. Um, and here's, uh, here's what it is. Take all the deductive systems that pertain not only to history, but also to what the various outcomes are in various situations, like decay probabilities. Require these systems to be true about history. Some of these systems will fit the actual course of history better than others. So, the virtues, simplicity, strength, and fit trade off. And the best system is the system that uh, gets the best balance of all three. Um, so now, uh, he also introduces this notion of homogeneity. Um, and uh, suppose all chance events fall into one large homogeneous class. Then, to fall silent about the chances of these events would cost too much strength. To assign equal single-case chances that differed from the actual probability, that would cost too much to fit. Um, we get the best fit by equating chances to the frequency, and the larger the class is, the more so. Uh, suppose the class isn't very large, and that the frequency is close to a simple value, say 50-50. The system assigns uniform chances of 50% exactly gain simplicity, but don't lose much fit. So now uh, David Lewis introduces the problem uh, that he calls undermining for this analysis with fit. And uh, first, uh, to get a picture of what it is. Suppose we have a humane analysis which says that present chances supervene upon the whole of history, future, past, and present. Um, then, different alternative future histories would determine different present chances. Um, and what's worrying about this is that um, uh, each of these futures will have some non-present chance of coming about, and th these futures are going to, to to change the present. It's just like um, here, here's a here's a good way of of uh, presenting it. Uh, let f be some particular alternative future, and one that determines different present chances than the actual future does. Uh, f will not come about since it differs from the actual future. But there is some present chance of F. That is, there is some present chance that uh, the event would go in such a way as to complete a chance-making pattern that would make the present chances different from what they actually are. Present chances then undermine themselves. That is, there is a present chance that a future will happen that will change the chances. So this is just this is just unacceptable. Um, uh, and now, uh, D David Lewis moves to why he thinks that unhuman analysis uh, can't fix this, and also why uh, the human analysis is um, sort of doomed under this. And he, um, he says that it is possible, or it is because some of the pattern lie in the future, that there is a possibility that the future could undermine present chances. Of course, it would go away if... We'd assume that the pattern lay entirely in the past, but we can't assume this, and uh, here's why. There's the problem of the early moment. Um, what could make the chances at a moment not long after the beginning? So uh, if you want to throw in a little physics, sort of imagine the moments just after the Big Bang. Uh, what could make the chances at a moment like that? And there's the problem of fluctuation. Uh, it is not to be expected that the different chance-making patterns and these different segments will all make the same chance of decay. And finally, there's the problem of drift, um, which I, th I think is sort of a combination of uh, the first two. So, suppose early on, J's divide 50-50 between K's and not K's, but so far there haven't been many J's together. Then we should expect that there might be a chance to be a run of K's or not K's that would significantly raise or lower the chance of the next J to be a K. 
then the chance of being a K would drift to one or one or zero and remain there uh, for a long time after. Um, and there is no refuge here for the non-Humian. David Lewis says that if you you can posit all the unhumian whatnots you like, so long as the truth supervenes on being. Uh, don't call any of these alleged features of reality chance unless you've already shown that you have something, knowledge of which would constrain rational credence, and unless you first convince him that uh, it's a special chance-making relation, where J has a 50% chance of being K, you, you can't just say that, you need to show that, which David Lewis thinks you can do. So, let's move to that solution. But first, uh, to what problem? Let's uh, get some credence functions and some probability functions to, to really pin down what's what's wrong uh, uh, about undermining. So our problem is where f is an unactualized future that would undermine the actual present chances given by E is that uh, the credence function that is uh, what tells you what you should believe or what credence you should put in some event happening of f given E it's, it's going to be equal zero because f and E are inconsistent. But uh, the, the credence of f happening given given e is going to be non-zero by the principal principle because e specifies that f is a non-zero chance of coming about. According to the best system analysis, information about present chances is inadmissible because it reveals future history. But this information is not inadmissible, as witness uh, by the way it figures in everyday reasoning about chance and uh, chance and reasoning. So we got a contradiction. What is this notion of admissibility into into the credence function? Um, well, it, it admits of degree. Lewis says that uh, proposition E may be imperfe imperfectly admissible because it reveals something or another about future history, and yet it may be nearly admissible because it reveals so little as to make a negligible impact on rational credence. Uh, degree of admissibility are also a relative matter, and what he means is that the perfectly admissible E may carry lots of inadmissible information that is relevant that is relevant to whether B, but very little that is relevant to whether A. And uh, near admissibility may be good enough. So what he means, or what he says about this, is that if E specifies that the present chance of A is uh, probability of A, and if E is nearly admissible relative to A, then the conclusion is that the credence function of A given E will equal the probability of A, will hold, if not exactly, at least to a very good approximation. So, um, we, we can use these notions of admissibility, and we can, knowing the problem, we can now work out what <coughs> Lewis's correction is. So, let, uh, let HTW be the proposition giving the complete history of the world W, up to and including time T. Let TW be the complete theory of chance for that world W. Let P, T, W be the chance distribution at time T and world W. If T, W were admissible, then the conjunction H, T, W, T, W would also be admissible. So we could put it for, uh, so we could put it for E in the old principal principle. And dropping those subscripts we have, this is the, uh, the old principal principle. Um, the credence of A given uh, the history of the world and the theory of chance uh, is equal to the probability of A. The correction that Lewis favors is his new principle that the credence of A given the history, uh, so the credence of any given event given the history of the world and the complete theory of chance is going to equal the probability of that event happening given the complete theory of chance for that world. Um, so Lewis says that uh, it's that the new principle is better from a Humean perspective, but um, the old principle is more intuitive and key to our concept of chance. And he says of this that chance can be defined as that feature of reality that obeys the old principle, yet chance doesn't quite obey it. He uh, asks if this is incoherent, <laughs> and answers no. Uh, a feature of reality deserves the name chance to the extent it occupies the role of chance, and if nature is kind, the chance the chances described by probabilistic laws of the best systems will obey the old principle to a very good approximation. Therefore, 
they will occupy the, the chance role enough to deserve the name. Uh, and he says that this to deny this would be silly. Conclusion. Let's uh, go back over what we've done. We've reintroduced human supervenience in the best system of analysis of laws. Uh, we've developed and rejected two concepts of what might make chance in the world, symmetry and frequency. Um, we've introduced probabilistic laws as and the addition to the best systems analysis that made that possible was fit. Uh, we brought up a problem for the human analysis of, of chance, problem for fit with undermining, and uh, Lewis solved the problem. Thank you. And uh, if, if you have any questions, feel free to, to email me or drop a comment below.